Good afternoon. Today's topic is going to be the long fight for birth control access in America. Birth control has always been around, of course, in various forms, both before and after the founding of America. It really became a big deal during the Gilded Age and ended up getting criminalized. And it took almost a century to make it legal nationwide. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So first, a note about modern birth control. Today, women can get access to all kinds of birth control that is safer, cheaper, easier to access than ever before in human history. You have, of course, the hormonal birth control pill, the first one of which was approved in 1960, but was not legal for several years thereafter. You can choose an IUD. You can use the morning after pill if you need to. You can use a diaphragm. You can get condoms. There are lots of things you can do. This does not mean, however, that there was no way of using birth control to limit your fertility, your fertility, excuse me, before modern times, or that some of these methods weren't safe and effective. That's what I'm gonna talk about today. And of course, of the fight for legalizing birth control methods once it became a, a big deal in the Gilded Age. So American birth control through the ages. Now, the historical methods you are probably aware of are the pull-out method and periodic abstinence, both of which have high failure rates. Everyone knows the pull-out method is horrendously unreliable. You might be wondering why periodic abstinence has such a high um, failure rate. That's because we didn't always know the secrets of female ovulation, and it was once thought that you know, the safest days to have sex without getting pregnant were those in between your periods, which we now know are the most unsafe days because that's when you ovulate. So what was the first effective form of contraception and also STD prevention? That was the condom. This is not a modern invention. Condoms date back to the days of Crete in ancient Egypt. They used to be made of animal skins. In Egypt, they were made of linen and the Egyptians even colored condoms based on the man's social status, which is really interesting. People also used various devices throughout history, including cer uh, primitive cervical caps. One doctor experimented using half a lemon. I don't have any clue how that works, but it sounds painful. Wound veils, etc. Some women also used homemade spermicidal concoctions and even sold them. And some of these were found to work when they were tested once scientific methods became available. So your old granny may have known what she was doing with um, the stuff she bought from the store down the street. All right, this is a picture of intestinal condoms. That is condoms made from the intestines of livestock. They are still available uh, today. As you can see, the picture on the left is a modern lambskin condom. A lot of men and women too are allergic to latex. And so this is the best alternative for them. The one in the middle, you can see it is there with its packaging below it, is from the Gilded Age. The one on the right is from the 1500s. That is how far back they stretch. And that is the ones we have pictures of, of course. We have other evidence for the ones before that. Right, the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age is most commonly referred to as the period between the Civil War and the first decade of the 20th century. But condoms were developed before the Gilded Age, modern condoms, that is. Uh, Goodyear discovered vulcanization, vulcanization excuse me, in 1830. This changed the world of contraception along with everything else. It didn't just lead to tires. It led to the first mass-produced condoms, and they became extremely cheap, reliable, and often available. So within the 50 years between that and the Gilded Age, other things became available too, such as diaphragms, IUDs, douching syringes, vaginal pessaries. These were all invented uh, prior to or during the Gilded Age using vulcanization. They varied by price, by quantity, excuse me, by quality, by how well they worked, but lots of women used them successfully. And during the Gilded Age, after the Civil War, their popularity surged tremendously. Here are some pictures of uh, cervical caps of varying sizes. We don't know the exact date this picture was taken, or excuse me, we know the date the picture was taken. We don't know the exact date of uh, the production of these, but it was somewhere during the late 1800s. 
These are a picture of vaginal pessaries. I hope they weren't as painful as they look, but um, they look they look pretty painful to me. Anyway, so the market for birth control exploded during the Gilded Age. America was becoming a consumer society. Information was everywhere. Information is the key to lots of things. When women learned better ways to control their fertility, they wanted them. See, controlling your fertility and the timing and whether or not you have children is the key to bodily autonomy. If you cannot control that, you do not have control over large sections of your life as a woman because you are confined to childbearing and child rearing for many years. Some men also wanted this ability. They either didn't want to have kids or they wanted to help space their kids, etc. STDs also became um, public conscious and um, became known to the public during this time. So who sold birth control? Well, to be honest, it was mostly small businesses. Usually it was one or two people um, working out of a small store, a druggist. Uh, I, often they were women, midwives. A lot of them were mail order businesses. You could not sell birth control openly in many cities, counties, and states at this time. So mostly, if you were, say, a druggist, you would sell your birth control out of the back room. You would have your main room, and then people who wanted to buy a douching syringe or a condom would go into the back room. Sometimes you might just have a locked case. Midwives would sell it from their homes. They would also do trunk shows. Um, they would go to places like churches even and lecture halls and give presentations on sex ed, on birth control, and then they would sell their wares. Mail order was also a significant part of the birth control business during the Gilded Age because information was available, but there was still a whole lot of backlash against it. You could not buy birth control openly in a state like Alabama, for instance, but you could order it through the mail and have it shipped to your house. Here is one of many old ads for birth control. It's hard to know if this was exactly a birth control pill or if it was an abortion pill. Those were available too. Uh, these, pill, these ads would run in newspapers, pamphlets, magazines. People would write in, send their money. They'd get what they wanted and what they needed in return. Just straight through the mail, no questions, easy peasy. Of course, however, the growing popularity of birth control led to a backlash. Overly religious people and conservatives, they never like people, especially uppity women having access to birth control because God knows what else you're going to do if you don't have to stay home and mind the children. You might want to get a job or go to college or something. So God forbid you have access to birth control. And during the Gilded Age, laws were introduced in many, many states, mostly in the South and Midwest, to ban birth control and its sale. That is when this pecker, excuse me, fine gentleman named Anthony Comstock came onto the picture. He lended his name to the Comstock Act of 1873, which was an act he and a few of his conservative buddies managed to get through Congress. It outlawed all forms of sex education and birth control, saying they were obscene, and gave him and his vice squad permission to confiscate it and arrest the proprietors. It was also allowed to be confiscated through the mail. So you could order your condoms and they might or may not come through the mail depending on whether or not the postmaster in your local post office or at any of the post offices along the way was a Comstock devotee. Fortunately for Comstock, no one much cared other than the religious people and the hardline conservatives whether or not other people had birth control. Congress didn't allocate enough money to hire all the inspectors and enforcers he wanted, and the Postal Service was overwhelmed, and the overwhelming majority of postmasters were like, you want me to go through the mail looking for condoms and sex education literature? Dude, I got too much to do already, and they just ignored it. But Comstock didn't, and neither did any of the other conservatives that were on his side. He had a whole vice squad in New York City during the end of the Gilded Age that he used with religious zeal to seek out and perpetrate birth control purveyors. But only the purveyors, mind you. Keep in mind that most of these items were mass produced by big companies like Goodyear at this point. 
one of the executives of a birth control company was on his vice council board. They were never investigated, neither was any of the other manufacturers of birth control. Only the people, most of whom were women and minorities, uh, were investigated by Comstock. One of these was Sarah Chase. This was an incredible woman. She was Comstock's arch nemesis. He went to his grave having wanted to send her to prison for birth control and failing. He pursued many, many people, arrested many, got convictions for a few, but she's the one who kept getting away. Like I said, she was a remarkable woman. She was a graduate of the Cleveland Homeopathic College. Most medical colleges would not admit women at that time, and this one was one of the few that would. Homeopathic College has a different connotation than it did now, but I'm not going to get into that. She went there, she went through, she graduated. Then she decided to take her daughter because she was also a single mom during the Gilded Age and moved to Manhattan, one of the um, busiest and as then as now most expensive places in the country to set up shop. She became a sex educator, an abortion provider, and a birth control purveyor. She gave lectures, she sold out of her house, her shop, she traveled around. She also sold um, birth control through the mail. She had a long and well-known career, despite or maybe and partially because of Comstock's dogged pursuit. They played a cat and mouse game for many, many years. She was first arrested by um, Comstock in 1878. He had a sting operation where he had one of his detectives pose as a man wanting to buy a douching syringe for his wife so that the detective and his wife could prevent conception. This is supposedly a crime in the eyes of conservatives because God knows God is only in control of your fertility. So she was arrested. They set her bail at $1,500. That was a huge amount for the day. And of course, she didn't have the money. She was a single mom working hard at a small business. But she had a lot of friends because she was one of the biggest birth control purveyors in Manhattan. All of these friends got together, many of whom were affluent, wealthy, well-connected. They bailed her out within a day. This is how little people cared about the fact that, you know, she was doing something illegal. So this was the first time her case came before a grand jury. The grand jury was all men, all white men at the time they refused to indict her. They did not think it was anyone's business, frankly, what she was doing. They thought the law was ridiculous. It was basically a form of jury, jury nullification. Comstock was infuriated. He snuck into the jury room after all but the jury foreman was gone and convinced the jury foreman to sign two bills of indictment against her, despite the fact that the rest of the jury didn't care. And he presented them to the judge. This caused a lot of uproar. He was um, penalized with a slap on the wrist. The charges were thrown out, of course. Over the rest of the Gilded Age, Comstock would arrest Sarah Chase four more times. Only one time was she ever indicted, much less convicted. That case was not about contraception. It was about abortion. Um, there was a problem with an abortion. A patient died. She was convicted. She spent a brief time in jail. She went back to work the next day. Uh, after her release because that was her job and that's what she did. Comstock didn't have much success prosecuting other cases either and neither did any of the few others. This uh, uh, car political cartoon, as you can see right here, I'm sorry about the resolution. I couldn't find a better picture and I'm not going to the archives for one picture. This is a woman standing here with the flag of liberty, leading her sisters onward in progress towards the future. This is supposed to be Anthony Comstock sneaking up behind her, the club on the head, and drag her back to the uh, Dark Ages. This ran in a uh, major publication, so you can see that his views were not well received even at that time. Despite that, there was a lot of support for his opinion among conservatives, and it took forever to legalize birth control. And the 20th century dawned. We have Margaret Sanger, who is usually associated with legalization of birth control, Planned Parenthood, and a whole movement that springs up. But birth control was not legalized for married couples until 1965. 
That is when the Supreme Court ruled in Griswold v. Connecticut that married couples have a right to privacy in the bedroom and no one could say they couldn't use birth control. It wasn't until 1972 in Eisenstadt v. Byrd that birth control was legalized for everyone, including single people nationwide. And it was based again on the same right to privacy. So let me make this clear. It took 99 years to make birth control legal for everyone in the country after the passage of the Comstock Act. 99 years. Why is this important today? Because the fight isn't over. A lot of conservatives and basically puritanical control freaks who think they have the right to control what everyone else does with their lives would love to roll back access to contraception. They still don't like it, even though the vast majority of people use it at some point in their lives. Any day now, the Supreme Court of the United States is going to roll on a case that could overturn Roe v. Wade, which is, of course, not about birth control, but about abortion. However, the draft ruling for this decision disavows the right to privacy that formed the basis for legalizing abortion. Where did that right to privacy come from? Griswold and Eisenstadt. The draft ruling says there is no right to privacy. If there is no right to privacy, is how is there a right to birth control? This is why this is a big deal today, in addition to historically. Finally, here is some more reading in places you might visit. The Dietrich Museum of Medical History has a um, exhibit with over a thousand historical birth control items. This link here is the history of the condom. Then you can read about um, some other things regarding the Constock Act. And finally, if you want to read more about black market birth control in the Gilded Age, here's a journal article that I really like. Thank you and have a good day.